All right, Mark Deering here from the Adventure Channel. We're doing another interview. You're never gonna guess who we've got. We've got Todd Poquette, and I hope I'm saying that right, but he is the mastermind behind all these crazy races that you hear about that uh, have crazy DNF uh, rates. Um, just if something crazy is gonna happen, Todd thought of it. Um, how's it going, Todd? Welcome to, the, welcome to the show here. It's going good. We've, uh, it's good to finally meet you and, and connect like this. Absolutely, absolutely. We were across, across from each other at the Iceman Expo, and uh, we were just starting to chat a little bit about, you know, standing on our feet for 12 hours and then uh, doing the race the next day. Probably wasn't the best idea. Um, I don't know about you, but I had, I had Burger King at 1030 that night before, you know, the night before just trying to get something in me, which was horrible. Oh, Kate, the guy that was there with me, Dave, I think he ran out and got us a burrito. I don't know where it came from. <laughs> That's all we had all day was a burrito. That was much better than I had. I'll tell you what, learned a lesson there, I think for sure. But so anyways, I, I got, I got some good questions for, I, I got a ton of things I'd like to ask you. Um, let's talk a little bit about this whole, I mean, my introduction to you would be the Margie. Okay, so that would have been like when I first um, started hearing about you and then a lot of our teammates, you know, were signing up for it and it was like the race, still is the race if you wanna um, really push yourself. So I guess let's start talking about the Margie. What's the, what's the mastermind behind the Margie and how did that whole thing come about? Oh boy. Um, well, the whole idea to the Margie when Danny and I started talking about putting it together was to create a race uh, 100 miles long and you know we just started kind of just pitballing ideas putting putting the course together you know danny figured it wouldn't be an issue at all to put together 100 consecutive miles because of just how many trails we have up here uh, but we wanted to kind of go against the grain which i think we're becoming known for instead of starting an ishwameen and going downhill which is technically easier um, we said, you know what? No, we're going to flip this thing. We're going to send it uphill. So it's the only race that is all uphill from the start to finish. So that's like, that was the idea behind starting it. And I mean, what it's turned into today, uh, we could sit and we could spend two hours just talking about how that one event has become what it is. There's so many things that played into it. That's insane. So that's insane. So the the um for those i mean most of the listeners here are gonna know about the race and in the um, distances and the elevation changes um but talk a little bit about that uh for those few that don't know about it what are we talking here how many miles um for each division and how about how much cl how much climb oh well, there's some debating on uh the exact mileage there's people who claim that it's 115 or 120 uh, Danny and I stand by the fact that it's a hundred miles on the nose, um, maybe 105, <laughs> not 120 right brands. Um, so this is where the psychology behind it comes into play, right? Like you look at your, uh, <laughs> you look at your Garmin, I'm almost done. You get to mile 100 and you're in the middle of the woods, the, the Ishwameen back country. There's no finish line there. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard a lot uh, of this. Yep. The uh, the climbing. I don't know. I think it was fourteen thousand this past year. You know, it it has <laughs> gradually increased every year. Um, just as we've uh, as we've tweaked the route, and as Danny and the crew in, in Ramba add some new stuff, it you know changes it. And that's a big thing that I'd like to, I guess, say about the events that we do in general, whether it's Margie or Crusher or Polar Roll. We strive every year to give a new experience, meaning the course is never the same uh, two years in a row, which, I mean, if you think about traditional racing, right? The course doesn't change. Like the whole premise right. is the race is the same and you can start to game it a bit. Well, the only game that's being played in our races is a head game with you <laughs> and we're at mm -hmm. the controls. <laughs> so it's, it's like, a, it's a whole different event. You know, it's not for everybody, that's for sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I will say that I have not, uh, I've not signed up and done, I've done it yet, but, uh, and I, and I shouldn't say yet because I'll get a lot of uh, buddies poking at me here, but uh, a lot of my team has, and uh, 
you know, some of my toughest guys I, I see coming, uh, you know, limping, limping back at mile 80, you know, and, and maybe even, you know, rave, doing the white towel at mile 80 and uh, some of my tougher guys. So I'm like, if they're pulling the, if they're pulling the plug, uh, I shouldn't even think about, <laughs> uh, think about doing that. But that's what your races are all about. Your races are all about totally I mean, obviously it's still a race, but it's all about challenging yourself. Uh, and the more I follow you on, you know, Instagram and, uh, or, you know, all the social medias, you know, I like your, um, your, your, your mindset, you know, your mindset is to challenge, every, you know, challenge yourself, challenge everybody. It doesn't matter what size or shape you are, uh, challenge yourself and you, you can do more than, um, you know, than you're capable of or you know you're capable of. And, uh, you know, I try and live by that too. Uh, I mean, not try, we, you know, we live by that too, but, you know, I try to be a little less bold when I'm, you know, talking to Todd about this because I don't want to, <laughs> you know, he's... Let's, let's dig into that for a second because you were just talking about guys from your team that have come up to do Margie, right? Yeah. And you've seen some guys who, in your eyes, they are in high regard. They're tough, they're tough guys. And you see them maybe tapping, you know, the second time in a Jackson Park, right? So, you know, you're seeing that and it's like, well, hell, I mean, if, if those bad mothers are tapping, you know, what's what's Mark Deering going to do, right? Right. But here's what here's what I've learned about Margie. And this is why Margie's beautiful. And actually, the in the other events that we do, we can talk about. The beautiful thing is most racing uh, tends to favor the type A folks that go out and they train but they train in a very predictable manner and they're effective not i'm not this is not broad brushing but a lot of them are effective within a controlled environment so to speak sure. right now you come to margie okay those folks come to margie and they have to start collecting checkpoint tokens and the number and the checkpoints are numbered out of order intentionally to mess with your head right now, all of a sudden, these folks that have only trained for performance of the body and not of the mind, they quit. All right. And yep. that's why I think that's why I think Mark Deering would not quit because I think you're rounded. And the people sure. who come to Margie and do it, they are not all like you've got, okay, let's, we got Bishop came and he crushed it. You got Wakely, you know, he's going to come up and crush it. You got, who, who else we got um Anchor. Uh, yeah yeah matt you know matt comes up the beard he, he, oh you know, i think you muted there. there you go you're back you're muted there oh. for a second oh sorry yeah a acker comes up crushes it right uh they can do very well but there's a lot of guys that don't there's a there's a lot of people that don't and it's because they're not mentally prepared for what we're going to throw at them that so makes don't no sense. Count, don't count yourself short mark Deering. Hey, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. My, my closest thing to, uh, which I'm not going to put them in the same category would be lumberjack, you know, and, and, uh, you know, I finished that second lap and I knew if I didn't finish that third lap, I'd be second guessing myself and, you know, having to re-sign up and have to redo this whole thing. And so I finished that, uh, and, you know, felt pretty good about finishing that. And like I say, I'm not putting those two next to each other because I do think yours is, yours is, uh, crazy, way crazier. But uh, anyways, yeah, it is all mental. Um, and that's what I say I like about um, your challenge. Um, and, and we've talked a decent amount about Margie. Let's talk about that because I hear the same thing kind of in the uh, pull the roll and the crusher. So Margie was kind of the first one. And then these other ones are like uh, sister sister races kind of. Is that how uh, it went? Well, pull the roll was first. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. And uh 15 in February. And then it was the success that we had with Polar Roll that okay. made us think maybe we can duplicate this success in another event. And we didn't have a, a hundred mile ultra endurance type race up here at the time. It, they, you know, like the hundred mile races at, at this time back in 15 were not as there, there weren't as many of them. So this was sure. still kind of unique. Um, so yeah, we thought we maybe had a niche there and, you know, we could kick off Margie and, you know, Margie also succeeded. 
Yeah, absolutely. There will there will never be, and I could probably say this about all three events. Not that I want to ever compare one year to the next and you know pick what the best year is, but there's just something about the first time you do something, like the first Margie. You know, there's barely a hundred people signed up. Um, a very intimate experience. Nobody knew what they were in for that day. <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> I mean. Guys heard about a belt buckle in 12 hours and they started to do roadie math and they're like, oh my God, I'm going to get a belt buckle. That's going to be so easy. I'm going to be dying at mile 40. Because roadie you know, math, it, I love that. It was, it was shell shock it, it, because they got into it and it's just, it's so unlike anything else, at least in Michigan, mm -hmm. that um, they just, they weren't prepared. And then, you know, you got signs on the course as you're, you're finding your limits out there and it says blame Danny or blame Todd, yeah. you know, I mean, there's, it, it took off. Cause it's like, who are these bastards? Because <laughs> <laughs> Right. I was, uh, I was just watching, uh, I think, I think I messaged you. I forget if it was you or messaged Rob, but I was just watching Rob Martin's, um, GoPro footage of the uh, polar roll. And I was on the trainer and, uh, sitting there watching those signs that he's passing, you know, and you know, the ones you put out there too. And, like you paid for this, you know, you paid for this. And, uh, um, oh, I love it. I love, uh, I love the mind games of it. So, so obviously, like you say, the course changes every year, uh, for Margie. Um, how about for polar roll and for crusher? Is that also ever changing or? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, like this year's course, we'd never, we'd never had this course, uh, in any prior polar roll. Totally new. I mean, there were elements of it that were familiar, but uh, Danny and the groomers did a hell of a job giving us a course that was just, it was unbelievable. And they worked their asses off, you know, that week leading up, especially the three, four days leading up to it, to, to get that course where it was. It was probably the best conditions or damn close to it that we've ever had. I, I've never, um, you know, I kept hearing different times about the drift over years, you know, where it was the, it was the hike a bike. Um, this would be a great hike if I didn't bring the bike with me, blah, blah, blah. You know, I heard all, I've heard all that stuff and, uh, watching that, watching that footage, you know, I'm like, dang, you know, and uh, I think I was talking to, um, Rob and he said from 3 AM on the groomers were out there. Like you say, the groomers were working mad just to, just to give those guys a, a nice, Nice setup and it worked. Definitely sounds like it worked. I talked to Danny. Um, I think this was this was after the race. So at three o'clock on Friday afternoon, day before the race, uh, Danny and his crew had been out grooming all day. Dave Whaley was out on a snow dog we bought helping those guys uh, in the single track. He had been out all day. All right. I'd been out trying to help doing some hand shoveling in between having to run to do other tasks related to pack a pickup and stuff. Um, at three o'clock Friday, we didn't know what we were going to have for a course on Saturday because the temperature still had things not setting up. There was a 45 mile an hour sideways wind that we knew was going to wreak havoc on the trail overnight. But the one thing we had going for us is it was going to drop down to like zero and then be below zero. I think it was 17 below with wind chill all day Saturday. Okay. So uh, from three o'clock Friday, I left. I had to go to pack a pickup and we had a bunch of stuff to do. And then uh, Danny went home. They got some rest. We went back out at 3 a.m. 3 a.m. in 12 hours. It's like the world changed. And that thing was wow. kind of, It was crazy. Wow. But Dan, Danny didn't know either. You know, he said he went home Friday and he wasn't sure really what we were going to come back to in the morning. But once they ran the plows through and they opened it up, it was, it was rock hard. I think I saw, yeah, you posted something, maybe it was Friday. And uh, I think I commented on there or something saying like, well, that's what people sign up for the uncertainty, right? Like that. <laughs> well, that, you know, that's, a, I'm glad you brought that up because Friday, morning there had been high winds thursday night also so the trail was shot friday morning well it was beautiful because somebody had taken a picture where they went by this sign and all the signs said on it was why with a question mark and big bold letters 
and there was sure. no trail. There was just a a bike tire track with you know footmarks where you could tell somebody had, had to hike yeah. bike there. Yep. And so I, I that's that is social media gold. Okay. Yeah. That is yeah. that's like going to casino and winning. If you send me something like that, it's going straight to social media, guaranteed to troll everybody who's thinking about coming. Yeah. So I, yep. I bet you people saw that Friday and didn't come because they thought it was going to suck Saturday. That's a great question. Like how many, so how many people DNS? I mean, uh, I mean, what's the percentage? I mean, I, let's talk about some DNFs, but let's also talk about some DNS. You know, is, is, is that, I think the majority of the person that signs up for your race is going to show up. They just get it. They just understand, you know, it's, it's, Hey, if it's going to storm, if it's going to, I was actually at the finish line on one of the Margie nights and the storm rolled through and, you know, I mean, it's just, it, you sign up, like you say on that sign, you signed up for this, <laughs> but, uh, is there any, any of that? I can give you some numbers now. This, these numbers are interesting. The DNS rate this year was 35%. Wow. Wow. Okay. But when I drilled down, so I was like, wow, that's, that's high. But mind you, the one thing I want to throw out is a, I guess, a, asterisk on that number is since the pandemic and COVID DNS rates are running higher than average at yeah. all events across the board. Yep. So that, that, that didn't surprise me. Plus we had what people were suspecting was going to be crappy weather and they were expecting sure. enough. They were expecting a polar push. Yeah. So that, that affects it. But uh, when I drilled down to the numbers, 260 people, let's say, signed up to do the long 240 of those people showed up there we go yeah in the short race uh 50 of the people signed up to do that did not show up so the majority of our dns was from the short event that makes sense that's kind of uh that's kind of what i was going by uh saying you've got this crowd uh you've got this crowd that um follows this and, and it, it is such a um mental tough thing you know, you're not going to waver those guys. You know, you're not going to waver those guys, and, and uh, you know they'll they'll show up just to finish it. And to, you know, I mean, so that's that's I love it. You know, that is a that is a, a cool little culture you got going there. You know, the um, numbers. Uh, something that's interesting if you look at Polarol historically. On that note, when we started Polarol, sixty six percent of the field signed up for the short race. Okay. So barely a third, it might've even been slightly less than a third of the field were signing up for the long one. Okay. But we, I do think, I think you're right. There's some, there's some truth in that these events have kind of helped flip that ratio because it is sort of the go big or go home mantra. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, we could talk about that. That's not people sometimes, you know, they get butt hurt because they think it's like a, you know, male bravado, ego trip, ego trip. That's not what it is, but we'll take right. we'll a table for a sec. Um, from 2018 forward, the polar roll numbers flipped. And since 2018, 66% of the people who come up here are doing the long race and uh, barely a third are doing the short. And the numbers were, yeah, I was gonna say the numbers are still the, it's, it's not like, um, yeah, no, that, so like the numbers that went to the bigger, it's not like the, the, what, or was it the shorter course people just said, Hey, screw it. I'm going to do the, the, or is it a whole group of new people? Um, I think it's both. I think that we're helping to develop Well, we've definitely got this community. I think that's extremely welcoming, you know, whether you do the short or the long, we're indifferent to that because actually yeah. we think we haven't done the long you should start with the short. You should be smart. You know, there isn't being the big tough guy. That's not what this is about. It's if, sure. the, if you're new to this and you haven't done this before and you haven't done our events before, you should come and sign up and do the shorter version, whatever it is, and get a taste for it. You know, so sure. you can kind of get, it's basically like you're hazing, so to speak. Right. And, and then level up. So I think a lot of people are leveling up. The other thing I guess I should add to that is as the numbers flipped and went 66% long, 33% short, 
the registration numbers have continued to go up every year. So it's not okay. like we just flipped where they're racing. We're getting more people every year. In fact, right now, this year, we have 15 days left in polar roll because we're running the EX format now. Oh, yeah. Yep, yep. Okay. Right now, our registration for polar roll is at 700. It's the biggest polar roll ever. Wow. Okay. So um, not only are we getting more people to go for the longer course, but we're just getting more people in general doing both of the distances. Nice. That is a good, good sign. Like you say, I think there's so many of us too that have been kind of cooped up, you know, from this COVID thing, um, you know, and we're, you know, just, I, I feel like this year, you know, thankfully to all the uh, promoters, all you guys that keep things rolling and everything, you know, it could be, there's never going to be a normal, I guess, again, but like the normal race season or the, you know, this whole, this, it's been crazy. You know, it's, uh, our team has felt it um you know go through and then no racing and then partial racing and then is the race going to happen and you know all of that and and, let, and like what you just mentioned too um you know somebody gets the you know a cold or something and then they're put under that that strictness of saying okay do i go and still race if i have a cold or is that going to look frowned upon just a whole bunch of craziness and let's not go down that road i guess that's <laughs> and talk about all that but you know what i mean what you're bringing up there is it's a valid, uh, it is valid. It has had an impact on people. I think that mm -hmm. what went on the last two years has affected racing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, ha I have had quite a few talks because I'm, you know, we're not just running events. We really are developing a community that isn't just here in Michigan. I mean, this is stretched now beyond the Midwest and we're, we're establishing national routes. So my contact with a lot of these folks who come up for the events, it's year round, it's 365 days a year. And we're not just talking about the races, we're talking about stuff that's going on in their lives. Sure. And, you know, it's, it's, a true, it's a true story what you're saying about the pandemic having an impact because there's just some people who they're not even interested in racing right now. And, and it's not that they're afraid or, or any of the you know, political narratives that people might try to slant on it. Mm -hmm. They're, people are freaking tired. You know, yeah. it's been a grind for people. So I actually think that um, the EX format, so that expedition style event we've been running, sure. that, we, that we started in 2020, that has been a godsend for a lot of people because hell, I don't know if you, if you knew this, Mark, but in 2020, when we ran that EX format, you know, we were both probably the only mountain bike event event or gravel event in Michigan that went off. Okay. And we had a thousand people do it that year. Oh, wow. I did not hear it's, that. Okay. Yeah. So it's a thousand people that did it that year. And here's, here's the best part. They did it whenever the hell they wanted to. Yeah. There was yep. no mass gathering. There was no mass start, but a thousand people went out there and, uh, took on the crusher. Now that you say that, I heard um, little glimpses of that. I heard, I heard different people, the Dikamas and different people uh, went up and um, did their little base camp with like two or three people or however they you know decided to do it, make a nice weekend of it. Um, you could pick your weather then. You could. <laughs> That's, you can pick your weather, you know, uh, polar roll this year. I mean, we hit a record number with 700. Well, I think 450 of them went to the, were signed up for the mass start. Well, that tells you 250 are doing EX. That's a third of the field. Sure. It's, it's def, it's, and it's even bringing people now into, um, I hate to even call it racing. I mean, you know, our big thing is basically adventure and, and experience, but people are coming in to do these events, mm -hmm. knowing what the format is who have never done a race in their life. I've had 60 year old women show up to my house to get their satellite beacon. Yeah. You know, that's the cool thing with the way that yeah. pressure's set up is I get to meet everybody. They have to come to okay. my house. So we sit and we'll talk in my driveway and you know, I'll have um, Ann Valiquette show up to get her, her beacon. You know, she's in her sixties and it's like, Hey Ann, how many races have you done? She's like, I've never done a race. I'm like, what? And you signed up to do the crusher? And she, you know, and then it's like, well, yeah, I mean, why not? I can do it whenever I want. I can do it with my friends. 
you know, they don't have the anxiety and the pressure associated with racing to worry about. And they go sure. and they love it. No, oh, yeah. That, it, so it sounds like, I mean, if I hear you correct too, like, do you think like, uh, do you think like this, that style format will kind of stick? Like you think even, you know, I, I sounds like why not, right? It, it's going to stick. It, it's 100% going to stick you know, what it looks like, how it affects, let's say our mass starts down the road. I don't know. I mean, it's easily turning 33% of our race fields into EX participants. Uh, but I, I think it's going to stick. I think it'll grow mm -hmm. because there's so many, um, I'll, I'll, I'll use an example from Polarol. So Beth, I, I don't know how to say her last name. Um, e -G -G -E, I think Beth, Eggie. So she came up to do polar with her husband and they were going to do the double trouble. And I'm going to share this story because people need to hear this story. Okay. So Double trouble got pushed because of the weather. Um, and we couldn't put, we could not put people out, you know, in sub zero weather um, with 45 mile an hour winds. It was too much of a safety risk. Um, and I, and I know, like, I'll tell you right now, Mark, if I had, if I had said, we're going to go, people would have gone. Sure. There's, sure. there's, there's a lot of responsibility in that decision. You know, people can sit back who have no responsibility or, or skin in the game and they can second guess decisions. But when you're the dude or the woman who's, who, you know, people are going to follow your lead. You better have your shit together. Exactly. So it, was no, tough to, it, it was tough to make that call. Um, but only because I knew I was taking a really cool experience away from those people who came here expecting to do it. It wasn't hard to do it from a safety standpoint because I knew it was in everybody's best interest. So we pushed that. Beth and her husband have to go and, and do the day route. And then they have the option to do the night roll as an EX style event Saturday night. Okay. So they go out to do it. I talked to Beth after the event and I think she might have either messaged me. No, she put a story up on Facebook about this. Her experience at Polar Roll was suboptimal because, and I'm not saying that she was begging on the race. She wasn't. What happened is she got out there. She got into the single track. She got into the event. She's surrounded by hundreds of people. And all of these gremlins of self-doubt come in. And, mm -hmm. you know, and, and she's questioning how good she is in comparison to this person. And she's not riding a great line or she's falling in the snow and it's just destroying her confidence because she is just being extremely critical of herself. And that is unfortunately the downside for a lot of people to these big mass start events that get neutralized mm -hmm. at a crusher or a polar roll EX, because now you're out with your tribe or your friends, whatever you want to call it, right? Yep. Yep. You're not in this, uh, this mode of self, of being self-critical or, or just being hard on yourself. You're with people you trust, you're with people you like or love. And the fucking goal is to finish. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter if it's an ugly finish or not, you finish. Sure. So that's why the EX is, is beautiful for a lot of people. And it can be every bit as, uh, as beneficial as a traditional race, if, if not more beneficial. The, you know, that's, that's interesting to hear, you know, I, I didn't even know that getting into this about the whole, um, the version of being able to just show up and do it. I mean, I, like I say, I heard, you know, glimmers of it, but that, especially, especially your style races, you know, the, the fact that, um, you know, and it was a good workaround to keep everybody. Cause like you said, the, the community, I mean, we all, we all as athletes, you know, we, we sign up for a race so that we have something to get ready for those next six months, those next three months. And by the way, I like your, uh, um, when should you start for Margie yesterday <laughs> promo that goes out, you, you know, you're already behind. Um, but yeah, so that, that's, a um, that's a really cool thought too, that just kind of net, you know, happened because of the COVID thing, but like the fact of, um, that's a, that's a neat concept. And, and, uh, I do see how that will continue to grow with, with, the, you, you know, the styles of sports, you know, to where it doesn't have to be, um, a two hour race that's chipped and timed and things like that. So 
Interesting. I uh, never really thought about that deeply until we started talking about it. So I can, I can totally see that taking off. Um, what are some of, I mean, I, I want to talk a little bit about, I got so much little questions I want to ask. So the, like the 906 Adventure Team, let's talk a little bit about that. I read on your, uh, the website um, and we do something on a smaller scale down here as well with like the dirt dogs and the kids and the things like that. That's really cool what you have going. Talk a little bit about that. You know, adventures. So the adventure, well, I'll clarify it. 906 Adventure Team is the name of the nonprofit that I work for. And th this nonprofit runs the events that we've referenced. And then there's also a youth component, uh, which really the whole reason we're doing all of this is to drive the youth component, the youth side, because that is, you know, the youth are going to be tomorrow's leaders. Yep. Um, so there is a, we use, we, we call it adventure bike club. And up until I'm going to say last year, you know, we, our youth program was sort of, it was known as the 906 adventure team adventure bike club. Mm -hmm. Now at that, during that time, we were running uh, bike clubs in Marquette, uh, Delta County, Gogebic County. And then we went to Eau Claire, Wisconsin last year. Okay. Uh, but we've, we've been fortunate that what we're doing and the way we do it resonates with people. They believe in it. They believe kids need it. So we've got a lot of momentum behind us. And we are this year going into three more communities. So we're actually going to be in Midland down below the bridge. We're going to be in Iron River, so another spot in the UP, and then we're going to Green Bay, Wisconsin. Wow. I saw that Midland thing pop up, and I was wondering if that's the Midland I'm familiar with. So, Yep. Okay. And uh, we also support um, Capital City Youth Cycling, or Capital Youth Cycling in Lansing. So we, and by support, what I mean is they're not, they're not under our nonprofit umbrella, but we provide all the, the background checks that they need for their volunteers. We provide the online training for their volunteers. We, we helped actually get them going. I was meeting repeatedly in maybe late 19 and early 2020 with their board and sharing everything we do so they could start their own adventure team down there. Okay. And then there's another one in Ohio that's modeling after us also. Okay. So you know, the premise to, we've shifted it from 906 Adventure Team. We're kind of putting that in the background because that's the legal identity of the org. Adventure Team now is going to be a production of 906 Adventure Team. And it's a youth adventure program. Okay. And, and, the, and you can say that really, if, if you took all the lessons and, and all of the self-supported ethos and, and the resiliency and the doing hard things aspect of Margie and Crusher and Polar Roll. That applies directly to the youth programs in an age appropriate way. Okay. Okay. So it's not like we're coming in and, you know, with the, with the same fervor. <laughs> you're not, you're not sending the 10 year old out on the same course. <laughs> well, not all the time, <laughs> but uh, I guess to highlight a few things about ad adventure, you know, the adventure teams and adventure bike club, what makes it unique is first of all, it is, we do view it as a youth development sport activity, but there is absolutely no head to head com competitive component whatsoever. They do nothing head to head. Okay. Okay. It's a hundred percent. When you wake up in the morning and you go look in the mirror, it's you versus you. So we're focusing the kids. Listen, you got a, this group of 10 kids. This is, this is your crew. Yep. Like you're there to support one another. We're going to send you out with a couple leaders who are there to support you, not tell you what to do, not have this overly structured experience. They're just, you know, there to make sure that the kids don't get too, too far out of hand. Sure. But those kids are literally introduced to adventure. The rides are never the same two times in a row. Um, nice. we don't make them, you know, we don't make them ride obstacles over and over and over again in a grass field for an hour because there's nothing fun right. about that. 
you know? Right. If you're, a kid, if you're a kid, it doesn't matter. I mean, they'll do some obstacles, but they'll hit them for a few minutes and then they, they need to move on. Sure. It, it's all about adventure. It's all about helping kids start to develop independence from their parents, learn how to behave around other adults, learn how to treat each other well, because kids are pretty good at being jerks to one another. Sure. The, the program is co-ed. Uh, so 45% of our kids are young women or girls. Yep. And 45, 45% of the coaches are female. Okay. And, you know, that, and there was no, there was no, uh, you know, there was no initiative that we created that somehow created these large, almost equal numbers. I think the reason we have what is almost 50, 50 is based on, uh, the number one thing you're judged by in our organization is the way you behave and treat people. Sure. I don't care. How, I don't care how talented somebody is, yep. you know, because yep. actually people take talent and they leverage it as, as a license to mistreat people. So right. I, I just, I think that the way we go about things in a very matter of fact, no nonsense approach is, has attracted equal parts, men and women. Mm-hmm. And yep. boys and girls, the sure. parents want to get their kids in the program. And, and the, on that note, I mean, I, I'll, I've been saying it a ton lately. Boys and girls can't learn how to, you know, interact in a way that isn't 100% awkward all the time. If right. we don't put them together yes. in scenarios and in environments where they have to learn how to come together, Right. No, I love what you're saying. Like this is this is uh, um, totally, totally, totally what the next generation needs. You know, like the, you know, mm-hmm. there. How many conversations? I even see it at, at uh, restaurants and different things where these uh, younger kids are going growing up with the video games and and not interacting with people, and all their communication is through texting and. The social skills are lacking. Um, they're they're intimidated. You know, their their self confidence is low as well because they're not getting challenged. You know, um, mm-hmm. and getting out in front of people and, and finding a um, safe environment to be um, you know to be challenged and and not in a way of particip- uh, participation trophies. You know, hey, everybody wins. I mean. You know, I like, I like your, your sign back there. You know, life is not fair. You know, mm-hmm. the world is not safe. And what's the third one? Um, there is no, there is no finish line. Yeah. 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 I mean, um, you know, they, where, you know, where it, the kids just need to put the, put the phone down, put the, uh, we, we try the same thing. You know, obviously our adventure brand, you know, is all about explore, stay active. Um, and it's, pretty much adults right now, just kind of like a community of adults where it's, uh, you know, stay active, explore, be social, um, you know, post your amazing hike or your amazing picture or whatever, that's going to motivate me to get off the couch and, you know, go hit, go hit a hike, you know, as well, or join you, be social, meaning, um, hey, let's, you know, one of our winter challenges that we did with the team was, you know, do your activities that you say you're going to do but you get bonus points if you do it with others, you know? So we're, we're, you know, making sure that that's a, a valid thought, like uh, reach out to so-and-so um, and say, Hey, let's go for that ride together. Let's go for that hike together. Um, so I love, love, love what I'm hearing there and uh, you know, doing it on the kids level, you know, doing it where, you know, get these kids doing so they could, they could, um, you know, they could be locked in and they could find whatever they want to find on their smartphone. They could, they could just sit there and, and indulge in that, indulge in that, indulge in that. Next thing you know, weeks, months, years go by and they, they didn't learn how to communicate with other people. They didn't, you know, um, yeah, I just love, I, I didn't know we were going to talk about this, but you and I think a lot on that uh, same on a lot of those vibes for sure. But let's, you know, let's summer, let's summarize for a minute what it's like to grow up right now as a kid. Okay. Um, they're surrounded by digital technology, mm-hmm. this digital technology and, and uh, immediate gratification and uh, this, just this overarching theme of comfort and safety. They're doing no hard stuff. 
Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So they're not physically and mentally getting challenged mm -hmm. all while. So they're not getting physically and mentally challenged, but they're sitting at home on Instagram or TikTok, mm -hmm. and they're and they're scrolling all their friends. Right. Mm -hmm. And all their friends are having the greatest day ever. Right. Supposedly, they're, supposedly, right, supposedly right. have the greatest day ever. But I'm trying to, you know, this is from like the perspective of a 12 year old. Right. All right. I'm not I don't do much of anything. I'm not active. I'm in my house. Nobody's paying attention to me because all the all the adults are too busy. And everybody is having a great day and a great life, but me. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. and that's their freaking reality right now. And, yeah. and, and and I say that because we're because we're not focused on pitting kids, you know, uh, to to race each other and putting all of our energy in the wrong direction. We're really spending all of our time and energy looking at how can we provide the best experience to help every child develop to his or her maximum potential. Mm -hmm. And, and so we have to start asking these hard questions. Sure. Right? And not from like some PR hype background to make it sound like we're trying to make a difference, but to actually get in the trenches. We had a, a uh, Zoom call, not a phone call. We had a Zoom call a week before polar roll with, it was a group of teachers, doctors, and guidance counselors. And I just, I called them together. They're all somehow connected to us or connected to people we know. And I just wanted to start asking questions like, you know, hey, teachers, in your perspective, what's going on in school? What are you worried about? What should we be worried about? Mm -hmm. We asked the doctors, what are you seeing in the last two years of the pandemic and COVID? What's going on with kids' mental and physical health, right? So they answer those questions. Guidance counselors, they had their unique perspective on things. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you what, man, the picture ain't pretty, you know? So, so, and it's not to be, it's not to take it to a downer, but we, we typically, including myself, um, we, you know, we, we don't, it's not that we ignore this. We deal with this every day. We're constantly looking at how we can change things and improve things for kids. But sometimes we avoid saying some of these things because they, it's a lot to wrestle with. Sure. Because it's like, once you say it, once, once you say that the statistics on um, middle, middle school and high school boys and girls are trending in a very bad direction, mental health is in a bad place. Um, girls are in a really bad place. Sure. You know, the the um, social media the way the the stuff works is really affecting them and it's affecting the boys too but once yep. we start talking about it well hell now we got to do something about it right right and that's yep. what adventure team is intended to do because i think every community should have an adventure team in it and i agree i agree we have we're fortunate because we have a growing number of close knit partners. Some are health foundations and some are corporate supporters. They believe it too. And mm -hmm. they're, they're helping us slowly expand it. So that's the adventure team side. <laughs> Man, no. Yeah. I, I, uh, yeah. Like I say, the, um, and this is why I wanted to do this. This is why I wanted to chat, you know, like say, I know, um, you know, I know, uh, you've got the, the Margies and the Polar Rolls and the um, these big crazy races. And I know you cared about the kids as well. And I knew you cared about the, the developing the community. And I know that you, um, you know, but I didn't know a lot of these things that we just talked about. And, and uh, this is going to be good to get out there for a ton of others to hear too. But um, that's, yeah, I mean, we're, you know, our, our Remax, we have a Remax racing team, and then we have a adventure um, team, which is just a community of people. And yep. uh, that is exactly what I'm all about as well. Like the, um, you know, the, the mental health of getting people out and being active um, and just, you know, especially since everybody was in, in closed doors there for a couple of years and didn't want to talk to anybody and, and, uh, so like I said, we just got done with the winter challenge uh, within our team. And it was, you pick how many days you want to be active. Um, and if it's two or six, and then there was bonus points. Uh, first of all, you had to do those. If you said two, you had to do two that week. If you said six, you had to do six that week. And then from there, 
Um, you had you got bonus points if you did it with two others. So you had three, you know, three of you. And yep. then um, if you um, if you posted socially that you were out doing something, a picture of your bike leaning on a tree or whatever, you know, my my theory on that is that that is motivating when I'm like, oh shoot, my buddy did get his ride in. I better get out. I'm just about to sit on the couch. I better go get my ride in. You know? <laughs> I mean, your Absolutely. stuff, your stuff that you're posting up there, you know, I'm like, you know, that's the, for my, for my generation and for, you know, for our generation and for um, people our age, I, I think, you know, there's, there's positive ways that social media works where mm -hmm. it gets people off the couch, uh, motivates them. Um, but yes, the younger generation, and I guess it probably happened in our generation too, where the teenage girl feels like she can't keep up with her teenage girl who is really good at the camera and really good at lighting and, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and makeup and makeup. <laughs> yep. Yep. Makeup in uh, the, uh, the teenage boy who, you know, might be out on, you know, dad's expensive boat and whatever, whatever, doing, doing some social media stuff. And then he feels like, Oh, I don't get to go out and do that. I mean, I can see where it could, you know, I'm not, that's, I'm not just coming to some new realization of that. We have some of that in our own household, you know, where we're dealing with that with adult kids. And uh, so, yeah, I, you know, my wife and I talk about this subject, you know, on a regular basis, because I'm a social media guy, um, you know, with my real estate, you know, we're big in social media with adventure channel. We're big in social media with my race team. You know, I love video. I love editing. I love all this kind of stuff. And, but, you know, there is, there is some side effects, you know, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, um, you know, it's something that needs to be noted and it's something that needs to be, um, you know, watched. And, and like I say, with the local, the local dirt dogs here is, uh, put on by, um, Daniel Musto down here yep. and, um, I do some coaching and uh, volunteering and uh, sponsoring and things like that. And it is, it is super cool to watch, you know, to watch those kids. You know, I coached a little little league back in the day too. And it's different than little league because it's such an individual sport and you're, and you're taking this person and teaching them that, you know, this is possible. This is, you know, and just watching them progress and build their self-confidence and, and, uh, um, you know, and some of them turn out to be racers and I'm like, oh boy, that kid's going to kick my butt in two years. And okay. some of them just learned to push themselves and they're going to be amazing accountants that push themselves to be an amazing accountant or whatever that is, you know? So, um, yeah, yeah. The youth, uh, we should talk more about that. You know, I want to stay in touch with you on that and talk more, uh, cause that's, uh, something that, um, I'm passionate about as well. So far, my um, avenue has been through the dirt dogs, but I'm always open to, you know, I want to hear more about what you guys got going and because uh, that, that is important. It's the next generation. It's the, um, you know, we need some, we need some life is not fair. The world is not safe mentality, not in a fearful way, you know, not in a complaining way, like, like, oh, I just, I just, I'm not, you know. I'm not uh, set up like that guy is, or I'm, it's just not fair. You know, it's like, well, wait a minute, nothing's fair. You know, <laughs> um, you know, and can I expand on that for a minute? Yeah, absolutely. On, the, on those three, because it, I, I think that's an important thing to touch on. So I've been saying for a while, this mantra that, you know, life isn't fair, the world isn't safe and there is no finish line. And I had a guy real quick, you know, I had a guy email me and he told me this story. It was a long story about how he'd never had any seizures in, in his life. Uh, but he came into a point in his life where all of a sudden he's doing all these ultra endurance runs and rides and stuff. He wanted to do Margie. And all of a sudden, all the blue, he starts suffering from seizures. So he, he had heard me say that, you know, life isn't fair deal before and he told me he's like you know the first time i heard that or i read that on social media i thought man that is harsh and dark and he was he didn't know how to grapple with it but then he went through this experience with um these seizures that came on out of nowhere and were unexplained and it changed his life and he and he wrote me because he's like i get it now i understand 
And, and this had to happen to me for this had to happen in order for me to be able to see what you were trying to say. And mm -hmm. so what I'm trying to say is when I say life isn't fair, you know, all of a kid at bike club look at me when I tell him he can't do wheelies and he'll say, well, that ain't fair. And I'm like, well, first <laughs> of all, your parents didn't sign you up for fair because life isn't fair. Right. <laughs> you know? Yes. And he's like, well, this isn't any fun. And I'm like, why not? Because there's rules. You know, then he'll kind of look at you and it's like, I'm trying to get parents to understand too. You can have fun and follow rules. They're not mutually exclusive, right? They don't, yep. they, don't, they don't have to happen at different times and in different places. So this whole life isn't fair piece is it should, if somebody hears it and if they can grasp it in the way that I intend it, it should grant them the ultimate freedom. Because what it's saying is as much as, society might want to lead us to believe that there's rules and laws and everything is structured in a way that it's all going to serve us equally in some sort of fair way, fair and equitable way. That's a freaking mm -hmm. lie. It's mm -hmm. bull okay. Mm -hmm. What you need to do is you just need to realize nothing's fair. Right. And, and anybody who tells you life is fair, they're probably the person making the rules and making sure that they're getting the upper hand. Sure. So when you adopt that mentality that life isn't fair, now it's like, okay, now I'm on my own here. I can't count on the rules. I can't count on other people to take care of me. Whatever's going to happen for me, I need to make happen. Yep. yep. Ultimate yep. control. Yes. Yep. So that, that's, what what that, that's what that means. Yep. And what it, you're it, saying there, go ahead. No, go, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I was going to say, uh, you know, the other thing that, um, you know, that other thing that goes right along with those that, uh, you know, I, I, I coach in real estate, um, you know, like I said, I, I lead a team for real estate and so on and so forth. And uh, so we, we deal with a lot of limiting beliefs. Um, you know, we, we kind of train around people's limiting beliefs. As I'm saying this, I guess it's kind of parallel to biking. And I probably use some of those strategies while I'm biking, you know, like the want everybody has the dark moments everybody wants to give up everybody wants stuff you know quit like hey i'm not i didn't train enough i didn't do enough i didn't eat right i said i stood on my feet for 12 hours you know all those things they, they mess with you and uh overcoming those but you know one thing that comes to mind too that uh, we like to try to you know say out there in especially the kids or adults or whatever that is where <clears throat> there's never a perfect time. Like someone will say, you know, oh, it's just been a crazy six months. You know, I can't wait till this, this gets past me. And in my mind, certain times I say it, certain times I don't, it depends on what I you know, feel like getting into at the time. But, you know, the next six months, this can be something different. You know, exactly. I mean, you know, you're, you know, this six months sucks because of this. Mm -hmm. Once that's over, the next six months is going to suck because of this. It's just mm -hmm. how you deal with that. You know, it's how you deal with that, how you overcome that, how you, um, yeah. So yeah, the whole, the whole, you and I, I think you and I think a, a lot of like in a lot of those aspects. If you factor, if you factor into your plan on the, I guess back to the life isn't fair thing for a minute. If you factor into the plan that there are going to be setbacks and things are going to go wrong and you're going to have really bad days, if that's part of the plan, like literally shitty days are part of your plan. Okay. Nobody makes that plan. Right. Because right. the world tells you every, you go on Instagram and Facebook, everybody's having a great day. Right. Right. But, but, but you're not, but that's bullshit because they're not having great days either. Right. So it's, it really is. You have to just factor into the plan. It's going to suck sometimes. And that's mm -hmm. just, part of it. that's part of the full experience. Yep. And, and then you just focus on getting through it. On the, on the world isn't safe piece, you know, this is sometimes I get, you know, some weird looks from parents on it because their, their immediate reaction is, well, what do you mean I'm going to tell my kids the world isn't safe? I don't want them to be afraid. Sure. It's like, listen, this isn't, this isn't, a, this isn't, it, this is not intended to strike fear. This is intended to say this world that we live in, your little house that you're in right now with the bikes on the wall. Yep. My house that I'm sitting in. Okay, this this comfort this comforting place, it can be wiped off the map in two seconds by the world that we live in. Yeah, we have no control over it, mm -hmm. right? 
Mm-hmm. Before polar roll, we got crapped on with four feet of snow, no control over it. We never felt sorry for ourselves one moment. We went out and we worked our asses off to make a great event. Yep. So it, it, the world is not a safe place. And what we need to do is we need to spend more time raising kids to understand it isn't, it, it, it isn't about safety. It's about being stronger. It's about being resilient. So being able over to overcome the hard stuff yep. because the hard stuff's coming for it. You yeah, know, overcome. You, I, I was thinking overcome right before you said, yeah, the overcome um, it's, it's, you know, the, uh, it's just, it's going to happen. And, and it's kind of cool, you know, that we're both, you know, in the bike world and what better, what better sport to learn that, you know, I Absolutely. mean, cycling is all about overcoming, you know, in, in, in no matter, no matter, I'm thinking back to my, you know, first days when two miles was way too far and way too long. And, you know, right. this, that 10 foot hill was, uh, I have to rest at the top and, you know, whatever all that was, but, you know, our vessel, our vessel that we get to teach that through is cycling, um, where the, um, you know, so that, that's kind of full circle. I like that, you know, um, everything, you know, and that's cool talking to you and talking through all of that. And that kind of makes a ton of sense now, um, why your races are the way your races are and, um, you know, challenge that person, find their limits, crush their limits, that's right. Walk past those limits and then all of a sudden watch them walk around with confidence, which gives them the ability to conquer that next wall. And, you know, and you're, and you're creating leaders, you know, you're creating leaders, you're creating doers. Um, it's attracting other doers. And, you know, then that just kind of helps amplify the whole community as a whole. And yeah, no, that's, that's cool. That's some full circle stuff right there. I did not realize that we were going to, go down that road but uh that makes a ton of sense you know what i think the best bike skill you can learn is like you you get all these big fancy guys and gals that go and they paid six hundred thousand dollars to become mountain bike coaches right sure okay do you know what the number one skill that they should be teaching people is and they and they don't i'm just thinking seat time like i've had a, uh i had a i just think I've, I've been coached by just a couple of different people. And then, uh, one local pro said it the simplest as all could get up. He's like, it's, you know, intervals and all that. That's all fancy and cool. And, but he said seat time, and you could solve a lot just with seat time, but I know go ahead with what you were going to say. Seat time is important. I'm not going to downplay that time on the bike. Absolutely. Cause it's not only good for your physical health, but your head. But what I'm going to say is the number one skill that instructors should be teaching and that people should want to learn is how to push their bike. And I say that, okay, now people are going to laugh at that. And and there is some humor in it, but Margie teaches this crusher teaches this and Polaro teaches this. And the only people that can't do it are the people who have huge egos. Mm. That's where, that's where the problem is. The people who can show up, and face what they can't do and put their ego aside and push their bike up a hill. This is a huge lesson in life to learn. And kids need to learn this too. Yeah, sure. it's harder to it's harder to program a 45-year-old man or woman mm-hmm. because you before you program them, you got to deprogram mm-hmm. years, years of programming that have been input. There is absolutely nothing more important than then getting to something you can't ride where your ass has been kicked, getting off that bike and, and continuing to push forward. It's mm-hmm. demoralizing. It's demoralizing. Yep. And this is coming yep. from somebody. I, I, I walk my bike probably on half my rides because we go and we go to do something stupid and yep. there's no other option. You got to push. Yep. You can't ride it. Yep. And it, and it isn't because we're we're trying to be tough guys or you know or or the group that i'm with is out there you know trying to have a contest to see who's is bigger it's because right. we genuinely enjoy doing this shit that isn't common right it's easy to do common stuff and it's easy to get common suggestions you know i mean 
people keep trying to succeed on playbooks that have been written by other people, write your own goddamn playbook and go play ball. Yeah. Do yep. it your way. Yep. No, I like it. I like Am I not it. supposed yeah. to swear on here, by the way? No, I, I think you're fine. I think you're fine. I don't think, I, I don't think, think there's I any, have a couple of times. I don't think, I don't think there's a 12 year old, any 12 year olds that made it to this point in the video. I, it, we're fine. I think we're, I think we're bad. I think we're good. But uh, no, yeah, this, uh, this is, uh, this is cool. Yeah. I'm glad we uh, connected here. And uh, I think we're going to have to do a part two to this um, and catch back up again. Cause like I say, this is, uh, this is good stuff. And um, like I say, I did not know all this, um, you know, about the, about the backstory and some of it and, um, and then the, the kid side and, and even some stuff we're talking about here. I think that's going to be super helpful to um, some parents that got some parents that uh, are in cycling and trying to get their kids in cycling. Yep. And, and uh, this is just uh, really good stuff. So let's stay, let's stay in touch and uh, yeah, let's, let's do another, it. let's do another 2.0 here in uh, six months or so. And, uh, but I really appreciate you spending some time and, and, uh, speaking of the world's not perfect and, uh, it's not fair and all that. I think that camera died twice. I if you <laughs> noticed, I've kind of switched to this and I'm really hoping that the volume worked with the whole setup. And if not, who cares? We redo it. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good, man. It's all good. That's, I get, I got off the bike and I'm pushing it right now. I'm just getting, <laughs> that's, that's right. Exactly. Awesome. Well, thanks, Todd. And uh, obviously, what's some of the main websites that folks could go to um, to check uh, on your races and things? You know, just have them go to 906adventureteam.com. That's the one to check out the main org. And then all you have to do to get to the other event websites would be to Google Margie Gessick, M-A-R-J-I-G-E-S-I-C-K, uh, or The Polar Roll, or sure. The Crusher. And they'll eventually get there. I'll sure. throw one other thing at you. This isn't 906 related, but I want to mention it. So did you know that we did a ride around the UP last, last year? Yeah, I saw, I saw the, yeah, I saw the Strava. Okay. So we, we had somebody with us and they were filming the entire ride. We were out there for seven, 16 and a half days. Wow. So the trailer for the film that's coming out, the trailer is going to come out, I think this week or next week. Awesome. Um, it's all I can say right now, but I, you know, it's the project adventurous Facebook page is the page that kind of chronicled the journey. Okay. There's going to be more to come from that. Again, it's not a 906 thing, but I want to put it out because I think that's another Avenue bike packing is another huge adventure Avenue that opens a door for people who don't want to do all the other stuff we talked about. Yes. And, uh, it's the, I saw the trailer this weekend it's phenomenal so i can't wait to see the actual film it's, love it it's, love it it's all about the ride around the up that Best sounds film. i'm gonna i'm gonna definitely uh tune into that i love watching that kind of stuff i'm a youtube junkie when it comes to you know checking out the divide and all these other crazy you know races and rides and um there's a guy on my team dave scott i'll give a shout out to him he is uh he is the actually he was the guy that I was there till one in the morning um uh, at Margie and I had, the storm came through and, and uh, he finished and he's our he's never he'll admit he's never a racer he's never racing he's he's our yep. bike packer he did the hot tent uh camping and I built, did some filming around it um to where he has his own little stove and it was below freezing and he spent the night and and uh so yeah, he's gonna love that. That uh, that's a whole another side of thing, and that's what another cool thing about our sport. You know, I mean, we've got we've got so many different avenues. Yeah. Um, you know, I joke with I joke with people I meet through real estate and uh, my and on my real estate team. I'm like, you just need a bike. That'll solve everything. You just need a bike. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. It doesn't help solve everything, but it helps you come over challenges. It helps you come over Absolutely. challenges in life and so on and so forth. But yeah, like I say, there's I look forward to um, seeing that that uh, video. Um, sixteen days, you said. Yeah, we were out sixteen and a half days. It was uh, one thousand six hundred thirty miles. Wow, wow! Yeah. And you stayed in the woods in tents, or what? Did, or what yeah, I think we spent two or maybe three nights, you know, inside a structure to dry out or, or do whatever. But it, the majority of the entire trip was outdoors and disconnected from uh, from the real world. 
So you got a teaser for it, but then is it like going to be like a half hour, hour movie or what would you say? You no, know, I don't know. I don't know how long it's going to be the, the full, you know, the, the film Aaron Peterson's doing it. Okay. Uh, so what, whatever he does, it's going to be phenomenal. The guy is just super talented. Yeah. Is that the guy that does a lot of 906 stuff up there? Like the, I'm thinking of, um, who am I thinking of? There's some vi- good vi- videographers up there. Um, Aaron did the blame Danny video for Margie. Okay. Okay. Yep. That's that's one that's been popular, and he does stuff all over the state for a lot of people. Okay, his work is is top shelf. When I when the when the trailer goes out and it's public, I'll send you a, a link to it. Cool, awesome. All right, well, hey, thanks again. And uh, yeah, this uh, this I did not know we were going to go down all these avenues, but they were perfect. I I loved it. So uh, we'll uh, there's a lot of people that are going to be new, you know even bigger fans and new fans, I'm sure of hearing all after hearing all this stuff. So I appreciate uh, you meeting up and um, hopefully, you know, you can help push the community forward. I'm trying to help push, push the community forward and um, get new people into it and, and, uh, you know, stop thinking that life's easy and just keep moving. (laughs) One day day at a time and one person at a time. That's right. Thanks a lot, Todd. All right, brother. I'm going to run. All right. Sounds good. See ya. Yeah. Take care.